a Halloween scare with a look at death in space. With Kevin Heath from Space Crystals. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. For our spooky Halloween special, we're going to look at death in space. Now, nearly 600 people have launched into space since Yuri Gagarin's first journey beyond our planetary birthplace. Now, during that time, uh, almost a couple of dozen people have so far perished during training or flights. Fourteen of these were accounted for by the pair of space shuttle tragedies. But beyond accidents, death is one of the great certainties of life. Something like that. To paraphrase Billy Shakespeare, all that lives must die passing through nature to eternity, even in space. Now, one gruesome reality is that human bodies may need to be recycled, perhaps even becoming fertilizer, the basis of food. Now, we're not going to likely to be seeing soylent space anytime, but nothing can go to waste in space stations and habitats. Uh, astronauts aboard the ISS, for instance, are required to finish all their food each meal, and even human urine is recycled back into water. Gross. Now, being an organ donor may be encouraged even more in space than it is here on Earth today. A million miles from our home planet, kidneys are likely to be in short supply. Technology may also bring us a new means of achieving some degree of immortality. By collecting and storing our DNA on the moon or in other space-borne habitats, we could keep our genetic code intact for billions of years. Next up, we talk with someone who's making that a reality right now. Kevin Heath, founder of Space Crystals. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Kevin Heath. He has spent a couple, of, a couple of decades in technology and space development, and he played a part in the development of Spaceship One. He is currently the founder of Space Crystals, and is developing a means to bring your DNA to the moon. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Yeah, you can just tell us a little bit about Space Crystals, give us an intro to it, and what are you hoping to do with the company? Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it, it, it was something I came up with a couple of years ago, but at that time I couldn't make it happen because there weren't commercial flights to the moon and there weren't commercial flights to the International Space Station. And, mm -hmm. and there weren't as many advancements in commercial space that's been happening lately. So this has kind of been on the back burner for a little while, but then now we can actually make it happen. We actually flew our demo flight earlier this year where we flew 30 crystal samples and um, got crystals in all of them to prove that we could actually pull this off. But um, the whole idea was I was actually in Europe and I got to see Beethoven's um, mausoleum, you know, and it's really big and, and they keep having to, you know, re-preserve it or, you know, fix it up because of time and weather and everything else. Um, and also near there was a bunch of funeral plots from uh, um, some Jewish folks. And they left them the way they are because they wanted people to remember how bad the Nazis were because the Nazis actually came in and, and tried to destroy the funeral plots that were there from the Jewish side. Um, and it, it really kind of brought home to me that no matter what we do on this planet, it's finite. Right. Um, and eventually time ourselves, whether we blow ourselves up or whether we hit by our meteor, whatever, um, it's, it's finite. It's not going to be here forever. But one thing that always stuck in my mind was that footprint on the moon from Neil Armstrong. Mm. Now, everybody says that's going to be there forever, right? Um, so the whole idea behind Space Crystals was, you know, how do we, 
how do we have something as a kind of a tribute to ourselves and kind of extend our immortality for lack of a better term. And uh, so I came up with this idea behind space crystals. I'd heard of people, you know, sending DNA into space and you burn up as you come in as a shooting star. And, and that's kind of cool, but you burn up, you're gone. Right. I mean, that kind of um, defeats the purpose. So I said, okay, well, what happens if we could kind of follow what like the Jurassic Park model where they found that, you know, the mosquito in the amber, right? Um, but the problem is amber is not a good uh, way to preserve stuff over on, you know, in space and over time, it's going to deteriorate. So we came up with this idea of synthetic crystals and we've, I'm working with a team of uh, uh, scientists and they found a way to extract the DNA, put it inside the crystals um, and then we fly it up into space to, to um, crystal solutions for each customer. And in space, we grow the crystals. Now, why do we grow them in space? Because in space, you're not um, um, governed by gravity, right? In, on the Earth, the crystals, if they formed on Earth, they'd basically be exactly the same, right? Because you follow the same formula. But in space, they're like snowflakes. They can grow in all different directions, different formations, different colors, different consistency, um, densities. So they are truly unique to each individual. And we're growing two per customer. So that way, when they come back, we can actually give one to the customer. And then we take the sister crystal and we put it on a lunar time capsule that was actually designed and built as part of a capstone project for Texas A&M students. So they were really excited about um, doing this for us. And they built this time capsule and we're going to bolt it to the side of a lunar lander and send the sister crystal to the moon with one gigabyte of uh, customers' personal data. And it's going to be there forever. Wow, that, that is incredible. So what is, what is the origin story of this in more detail? I'd love to know, like how, I mean, you get this idea, okay, you know, Neil's footsteps have been there, or are there essentially forever. Correct. Right? But how did how did you bring you know crystal growth into it? Um, what what was the inspiration for that? I, I really don't know. It, it, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm I'm an idea guy. I always think out of the box. I I just one day I was sitting with some friends of mine and we were talking and I was just trying to figure out you know just talking out loud you know bouncing the ideas off of people and right. and then all of a sudden it's like wait a minute what if we grew crystals in space? And they're like, can we do that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's interesting about this endeavor is it's not just about um, customers. There's actually real science here. Crystals have never been grown to the size that we're growing them in space before. And they've never embedded DNA in crystals before in like this. So we're actually, we're doing some real science. And in fact, we had crystal growth in all of the samples that we flew, but what was interesting is we flew test, um, we didn't fly test crystals. We had the same set of, as part of an experiment, right? the same set of uh, formulas that we flew in space, we flew on the ground, right? Flew on the ground. We put them, we had them on the ground so we could have comparison, right? Did we get crystal growth on the ground and did we get crystal growth in space? What was really weird is in some of the vials on earth, we didn't get any crystal growth, but we got crystal growth in space. So what was the variable? Is zero G really that effective? Was it the vibration on the way up? I mean, what was it? So we really are doing some interesting science here as well as offering this to the general public. Hmm. And it's, you know, I think people throughout history have strived for some sort of immortality. You know, some people see their immortality in the form of children. Others build monuments. Yeah. Um, you know, others, with space facts, create wars in order to get their names in the history books. Do you see putting DNA in space as being, um, being a way of getting that same sort of immortality? Uh, it's a first step. Is it the step? We don't know. Um, but as opposed to just, like I said, building a big giant mon monument to yourself, um, the idea of sending your DNA with all of the data that tells your story, um, you know, who knows, a thousand years from now, 5,000 years from now, somebody runs across this thing sitting on the moon, 
I guess we'll ask ourselves in 5,000 years when we get cloned, hey, it works. <laughs> and actually that segues really great in my next question, which is, is the DNA destroyed during this process? Or, you know, is there a chance that it can be extracted at a future time? It's not destroyed. It's actually in the crystal. It's part of the solution. So it's embedded throughout the crystal and that's part of the preservation process. In addition, it's inside um, storage containers and then with shielded with the actual lunar capsule itself. I mean, the lunar time capsule itself. So there's multiple layers of preservation that we're doing. Um, it's the best we can come up with, with the technology that we have. So, you know, will it forever be preserved? We think so. Uh, which is like I said, we're just going to have to have people tell us in a couple thousand years if it worked. But at this point, it's the best way that we can come up with to do this. And we'll see what happens. <laughs> That's great. So hopefully, you know, hopefully like in 66 million years from now, Ooh. there'll be some futuristic <laughs> Jurassic Park, <laughs> maybe called the Athrocene Park, where a uh, Futuristic creature looking strangely like Wayne Knight sabotages <laughs> the park and zombie humans go running around them. <laughs> well, this is definitely a uh, Halloween theme for sure. <laughs> uh, so um, what is the timeline for something like this? When, when can I send my DNA to the moon? Um, actually, we just announced the program today um we are taking orders and and uh sending out uh, sample kits right away um there is a timeline in regard that we can't control which is the launches right mm -hmm. so we are sending up the uh crystals to be made uh on orbit uh, near the end of the year and then we're sending the crystals to the moon near the end of next year but literally, if you bought this today, this time next year, you could look up at the moon and know your crystal set. Hmm. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. And I have to ask, what's the price point on this? That's the key. It's very expensive to send hmm. stuff to space. It's like $10,000 a kilogram to send it to orbit. And it's a million-ish per kilogram to send it to the moon. So this, unfortunately, this program is not for everybody at this point. Uh, once we do it enough, then we hopefully can drive the price down. But right now it's $150,000 per customer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And of course that will come down like any technology, like That's the come plan. Down yes. any technology does, right? And there's potentially up to seven flights that we can get on going forward. So if there is a high demand and we can take advantage of economies of scale and drive the price down, then maybe, you know, a couple of years from now, we can get the price down a lot lower. But at this point, it's just very expensive to send stuff to space. Hmm. And uh, just looking forward to the future, you know, we've been talking this episode about, uh, you know, about death in space and <laughs> So this is certainly one means that, you know, we might have to deal with the inevitable deaths that will come as we move beyond the earth. Um, but what other ways do you see us dealing with death in the ways of funerary practices or strives towards immortality, a sense of immortality? I have no idea. I mean, they were talking about cryogenics and, and all these other ways, but you know, some of those processes are based on, you know, humanity and civilization still being around. But if you're talking about, you know, an asteroid impact or, or us blowing ourselves up with the way <laughs> we're acting nowadays, um, there's, there's not a lot. So, I mean, I'm a firm believer in what Elon Musk said, which is if we're going to survive, we got to get off the planet. Right. Um, we either got to have moon bases, we got to be on Mars, you know, whatever. See um, all of the above. Yeah. And, and right. we can't do it from here. And I really kind of equate this to the early days of, you know, the pioneering where we, you know, we're sailing across the ocean, having no idea how far we have to go and what we're going to end up with. Are we going to come back to where we started? Or are we going to hit something? I mean, that's literally what space is. And what really is exciting nowadays is, you know, the James Webb telescope went up and mm -hmm. thank 
goodness, it worked. Um, but one article I read talked about the images that we're getting back of all of these galaxies. And they said, they said the, 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 not the angle, but the point of where this telescope is looking is like holding a grain of sand at the end of your hand and looking. And that's, that's where the James Webb telescope is looking. And it's seeing all of this stuff. And you're like, holy crap, we got a lot of stuff out there to explore. And I don't know, it's just, it's an exciting time. It really is. So finally, what's next with you and with space crystals? Well, the interesting thing is, I mean, um, we're the first set of crystals we're flying are amethyst. So the purple looking yeah, crystals. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the next run, we could be flying rubies, emeralds. You know, right. literally, you could end up with the Thanos glow. Right. <laughs> I, I promise to use it in moderation. <laughs> well, it won't help you destroy the planet or anything, but um, the whole idea is, you know, how do we grow? How, you know, how do we offer more features, more benefits, um, and ultimately get the price down? The whole idea is, you know, repeat customers and, and doing this more than once. And so, but what the sad part about this is, you know, our target is around 260 customers for this first flight. The max we can possibly do is 522. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, unfortunately, the price point and the scarcity of this isn't going to be for everybody. Um, but the goal is after we do this first run, then we can make larger time capsules. We can uh, offer more, more availability. But yeah, this first run, the, this very first year, the max we can do is uh, 522 people worldwide. That's not a lot. That's not a lot. All right, all right. But it's a step in the right direction. It's amazing. You're doing great work. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And that was uh, Kevin Heath, founder of Space Crystals. Now, in the film, Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, we see a famous funeral scene showing the body of Commander Spock being launched onto the surface of a newly rejuvenated planet. Listen, don't write to me about spoiling the ending of this for you, okay? You've had 40 years to watch that film. That's on you if you haven't seen it by now. Now, possibly by the year 2285, when that film is set, we may be able to afford to dispose of material in the form of photon torpedoes turned into a coffin. For the foreseeable future, however, we either need to recycle the organic materials of perished crewmates or cremate their bodies. Cremate the crewmates? <laughs> Now, cremation would also have the added benefit of allowing inhabitants of space stations, moons, and planets to keep the ashen remains of their loved ones close at hand in much the same way that we do today. During the opening decades of human habitations on other worlds, there will be little room for cemeteries. Now, interestingly enough, this could cause significant religious strife between space bearers in the near future. While Islam and Judaism typically forbid cremation, Hinduism requires cremation as part of a last rite or anthem sanskar. Now, one option in this dilemma may be, in some cases, we might bury bodies on the moon or Mars. In either place, water in the bodies would quickly boil off in the near vacuum. Body parts containing water would swell before ultra-dry conditions would desiccate or mummify the corpses. Now, you add in some fresh DNA and you get Lunar Zombies! Join us next week on The Cosmic Companion as we look at asteroids exploring Ryugu and the giant laser. 
We're going to be talking with S. and Er John Elk, senior physicist at Argonne National Laboratory, and physicist Barbara Levine from the University of Chicago. These two researchers have spent the last year studying the first samples of the asteroid Ryugu using, you guessed it, a giant laser. And they're going to tell us what they found. Make sure to join us then. Now, this week, we have a special treat for you. Visit us at thecosmiccompanion.space and enter a 3D haunted lunar base. We've created this brand new 3D virtual environment in Second Life. So if you're already active in Second Life, see you there. If you don't have an account or an avatar yet, you can create a free account and your virtual doppel doppelganger quicker, quicker than you can say vampires from Mars. Mars. Check us out at the Cosmic Companion Haunted Lunar Base this week only. Want to see more? Sign up for the Cosmic Companion newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com and never miss an episode. Free and VIP plans are available. Clear skies and happy Halloween! Happy Halloween. Halloween. Halloween.